Well, I, um, I always find it really confusing when I'm asked to come and speak at something like this. Um, I've realised now that I've beaten cancer, people expect that I have some pretty incredible life advice to dish out. Um, but the secret to happiness is hidden somewhere in bags of chemotherapy. But the truth is it's not. The truth is I'm not qualified to talk to you about life because I have no life experience. I'm an 18 year old kid who's been asked to lecture a room full of adults. But what I am qualified to tell you about is how lucky you are to be here tonight because that is something that I do understand. Cancer is inherently hard to talk about. It's shocking, it's confronting, and it's uncomfortable. Everybody here knows someone who has died from it, so why would we want to talk about it? I, um, I was sitting in a cafe writing this speech a few days ago, and I went up to order a coffee, and the woman at the counter said, oh, have you been in a fight? And I went, no, no, I haven't been in a fight. But the reason she asked me that is I have a scar, I have a dark mark under this eye, um, which is from my cancer. I had a tumour under there, and as the tumour shrunk, it scarred and darkened. So she said, no, I haven't been in a fight. Um, I kind of had in retrospect. Um, but she kind of kept pressing for an answer. She said, oh, did you walk into a door? Or did you fall down some stairs? And I, I kind of just, with complete disregard, blurted out, no, I had cancer. And she was horrified. She was absolutely shocked. Her apologies wouldn't stop. I, I mean, I got a free coffee out of it, actually. But <laughs> I might have to try that one more often. <laughs> anyway, another time, actually, um, another cafe, believe it or not, I think there's something about baristas. They're just inherently nosy. Um, and I went up to order, and the guy said, oh, what have you done to your arm? And this time, what I'd done to my arm is I had a pick line inserted into it, which is sort of like an IV line left in for chemotherapy to, chemotherapy, chemotherapy to be put through. And so he said, oh, what have you done to your arm? And I said, oh, I got cancer. And the guy just recoiled. I mean, it wasn't malicious in any way, but he was just horrified, and the mouths around us dropped open, and my girlfriend was like, oh, you are such a dick. <laughs> but, but the point of those stories is that my complete disregard for the social stigmas around cancer has got me into hot water a few times now. But the thing is, for me, cancer isn't uncomfortable, and cancer isn't shocking. Cancer is a part of my story. It's a part of my history. It's a part of my life. I'm not afraid of it, and I'm not uncomfortable about it, and so I hope that when I share my story with you tonight, you won't be either. So in September last year, I began to experience some pretty sharp pain in my wisdom teeth and my jaw. It was just as my wisdom teeth were beginning to erupt, and so I assumed they were impacted, and I went to the dentist. Um, just toothache, right? Well, spoiler alert, it was not just toothache. My dentist took some x-rays of the jaw which showed a large mass on one side and he said it wasn't a cyst or an abscess but he didn't know what it was. So he sent me away to have them removed. Now during this time the pain in my teeth meant that I couldn't chew any food and so I was living off soup and up and go but it wasn't surprising because of that that I dropped nearly 15 kgs although looking back that was a sign of something much more ominous. So while we were waiting for this appointment to have my teeth removed three weeks away, my health deteriorated even further. I lost feeling in the lower half of my face as the tumours pressed on the nerves. And I got into bed one night and I didn't get out the next day. I had never felt so sick in my whole life. When my teeth were removed, it was, in my dentist's words, pretty gross. But as per usual, he cleaned the gross stuff attached to the teeth off and bagged them up and gave them back to me to take home. So yes, he cleaned big chunks of cancerous tumours off my wisdom teeth, bagged them up, and I put them on my bedside table. So we expect me to start feeling better now that my wisdom teeth were out, but no. In rather spectacular and dramatic fashion, I started throwing up blood on my mum's carpet for maximum kind of horror movie gore style effect. And on the 22nd of October, I was admitted into AMAR, or the Acute Medical Assessment Unit at Christchurch Hospital. The series of tests and procedures began. By this time, the cancer had grown so much in my jaw that it was growing out of my wisdom teeth sockets. It was keeping me from closing my mouth, and you could see it in my reflection in the mirror. Blood tests showed that my kidneys were failing more and more each day, and apparently the cancer was now doubling in size every 48 hours. So following a kidney biopsy, a bone marrow aspirate, a gum biopsy, 
an MRI scan and an ultrasound, a diagnosis was reached. I was told that I had stage four Burkitt's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, presenting the most aggressive form of cancer in the world, presenting in my kidneys, my eye sockets, my nasal passages, the membrane around my brain, my pancreas, my bone marrow, my spinal fluid, my cheek, and my jaw. I was given two to three weeks to live without treatment and not necessarily a guarantee of life either way. So where do you go from there? You're 18 years old and you're told that you could die within weeks. You are told that everything you'd been promised since you were a child, the house, the family, the job, might never be yours. You're told that the next months, the laughs, the parties, the classes, the times with your friends, they will never happen because you will be in a hospital bed fighting for your life. You're told that everything that you assumed would always be yours, the things which your foundation is built upon, the times with your family, the embrace of your girlfriend, or the sunrise on your face might not be yours to feel any longer. You're told that your time is up, if not the time that was your life, then the time when you had it easy. Now you are in an arena, fighting the biggest battle you will ever fight for the greatest prize that there is. Many enter that arena every day, but there is a limited number of spaces available on the other side. Not everyone will make it through. You've got an advantage, you're young and you're fit, but then again, you don't take that for granted either. So where do you go? You go to the bone marrow transplant unit at Christchurch Hospital to do battle. That is the arena, the one that you share with others on the same journey, and while you're there, you see them doing battle. You see them thin and frail, shuffling down the corridor outside your window, bald and gaunt, and you're shocked by the sight of it naturally, until you remember that that's what you look like, and then you're horrified. And it all becomes real about the same time that you figure out why the person in the room next door has gone home from hospital and not come back, or when you look into the eyes of your parents and you realise that they are dying just as much as you are from this. That is when it is the rawer, rawest and the most pure that it can get. The most pure pain, frustration, grief, strength and wisdom, determination and fighting spirit that exists. It coats the walls of the hospital room, the looks on the faces of your family or the inside of your sick bucket. That is when these ideas become tangible rather than just mental. At the moment you see a big bag labelled toxic hooked up to your arm and you know that it really just contains your future and your determination to reach that future. One of those many bags contained the moment that I spend here talking with you. Another one contained the last week that I spent on the Gold Coast with my girlfriend. Another one contains the next week that I will spend with my family. So I'd arrived on the BMTU, the place where I was about the third of the average age of a patient there. I was placed in isolation for my own protection and I spent the next 50 days in that room leaving only once to make an end of year speech. The first night there, I lay in a slumber in a strange place surrounded by complete strangers. I did not pray to live. Instead, I asked that if this was going to be the thing that killed me, that I faced it with strength. If it was going to kill me, it would do it on my terms, and I would not die a coward, not wanting to let fear dictate my death any more than it had dictated my life. But no, no way, there was not a chance in hell that I was going to die of this. The next few months flew past in a blur. There was a lot of repetition and a lot of laying around and spending 50 days straight in the same room is just as boring as it sounds. So I don't have much to tell you about it, but along the way I learned some pretty good lessons. Things which have taught me the value of life and changed my life for the better. So here's the most valuable things that I've taken away from my experience. Embrace each day. I was dying to get home from school. I was dying for the weekends. I was dying for the school holidays. And then before I knew it, I was dying in Christchurch Hospital. And I know now how much, and I know now how important it is to make the most of it while you can. And I, like most people, always really hated those cliched phrases about living life to the fullest and all that. But now that I've been through what I have, I realise I only hated it because I didn't truly understand them. 
And I don't think you can understand it unless you've been through it or someone close to you has been through it. Because it's very well for me to paint a scenario where one week I'm playing sports, doing my end of year exams, being the head boy at my school, spending time with my friends and my family, and then the very next week I am in a hospital bed fighting for that life. But I never could have really imagined that it would happen or picture it until it did happen to me. However, the most important thing that this has taught me is to take each day at a time. This is another phrase I used to really hate because I didn't understand it. I always used to look, like planning ahead. I always had a five-year plan for myself and where I wanted to be. And there's no problem with that at all. But now that I've been through what I have, it's taught me how to take things day at a time and focus on the short-term goals to live in the now. If I had started this process and looked at the hundred days of chemo that lay ahead of me, the terrible medical procedures, then it wouldn't have been manageable. But just by knowing I had to get through today and ignoring the fact that there was more chemo tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that, it made it all seem bearable somehow. Taking everything day by day allows you to focus on the now and really appreciate life. And tied in with that is the ability to find the little bits of light in the darkness because sometimes they will be all that you have left. Yes, I might have a spinal injection of chemo today, but there's something good on TV tonight. Yes, I might have my head in a sick bucket right now, but I'll never feel this sick again in my life. Yes, it's happening to me, but it's not happening to anyone I love. Once you can enjoy these little things in life so much, you can't begin to imagine how amazing the big things are. It's something I remind myself of each day and it makes every day that little bit better. Think about the worst thing that has happened to you in your life, the event that you would deem the most harmful thing to have happened to you. Now what I realised when I got cancer was that people had been through worse things than I had and they'd got out the other side of it okay. Is that applicable to your story too? sounds like a terrible thing and an insensitive thing to say, but it's true, and some days it was that thought that kept me going. I had cancer, but I knew that I would and I could beat my cancer. I might have had months of chemo ahead of me, but other people had years ahead of them. My grandmother was a really big believer in this philosophy because she came from a time when they had no other choice but to live by this motto. And the phrase that she imprinted on me was, is it as bad as Auschwitz? And without fail, time after time, the answer is always no. Was me getting cancer as bad as Auschwitz? No. Was your car breaking down as bad as Auschwitz? No. Is anything that has ever happened to you or will ever happen to you in your lifetime as bad as Auschwitz? No. And in some ways, it's refreshing to know that. It's refreshing to know that people have been through worse things than you're going through, and they've made it out the other side okay, just by being stronger than you are. If you ever doubt your strength, remember what other people have gone through, and know that you're capable of that too. I already know that I don't have the power of words to make you understand how delicately balanced your life is around you. It's not just whether you could get sick or hurt or killed, it's everyone in your life around you. And your life could change beyond recognition in a week, a minute, a second. But that's not a reason to fear the future. The point of it isn't to scaremonger, it's to make you understand how much you take for granted. So what should you do about it? There's lots of things that people do about it. They give money to cancer, like tonight. They volunteer their time, and both those are excellent, but the thing that people are really prone to doing is to spending time on feeling sorry for people whose situations they cannot change. And there's no point in that. What you really need to do is be grateful for the people in your life and for your ability to live that normal life. Because it seems impossible, but next week you might be fighting to cling on to that. So when you sit down for your next annoying family dinner, enjoy it, because you might not get to eat as a family again for three months. And sure, it's overly emotive and it's dramatic, but it's true and it's what happened to me. No matter how much you tell yourself that it won't happen to you, it doesn't work like that. 
believe me, I was never going to be the kid that got cancer, but it turns out that I was. But like I said, this morbid reality is not a reason to be scared or afraid, it is the complete opposite. Live each day with passion and pride to your very fullest, because you are able to. Every morning that I wake up, I know that I am on borrowed time. Every day that I live is another one longer than I was supposed to. And that spurs me on. But what is any of this to you? What is my story to you? You couldn't have prevented me from getting cancer. None of you could have saved me from it. You couldn't be there to rub my back while I vomited or been there to support my mum as she watched her son die. But what you're doing tonight is raising money for cancer, and that cancer research is far more important than anything you could have done to me. The progress being made is so far beyond me, but in some small way, I'm a testament to that. Only 25 years ago, Burkitt's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was not treatable. That means that 25 years ago, 9,000 days ago, in the lifespan of most of you in this room tonight, if I had have been diagnosed then, I would have been left to die. I would have been a hopeless case. My family would have had to sit around and watch. Maybe I would have helped plan my own funeral at age 18. That is the power of the research that you are funding tonight. But that incredible progress is not a reason to stop now. I am not out of the woods yet, nor will I ever be really. I could still die from my cancer. And so could you. Many of you will, statistically speaking. We, you and I, need events like tonight to save ourselves. That is the power of what you are doing tonight, and you should feel fantastic about it. So please, leave here today, but do not slip back into your old life. And it's all too easy to do. It's dangerously safe. It's uncomfortably comfortable. It's worryingly easy. It is the natural thing to do. It's only been four months since I was announced in remission, but some days I see the appreciation which me and my family developed for life begin to fade as they slowly become more and more focused on the day-to-day -day issues. And that's fine, we all have to move on at some point. But I know for me, I can honestly say that that is the first thing I think about when I wake up every morning. I wake up and I realise that I'm not in another hospital bed and I'm not in a box in the ground, and I smile. Every day starts with me not being dead, and what a fantastic way to start each day. If you start a day like that, what can go wrong, honestly? And I know that you haven't all been through something like this. Many of you will have, but not all of you. But that is no excuse. That is no excuse to not appreciate life fully. You owe it to the people that are unable to. You owe it to them to do them that service, to go out and do your best. You don't have to go through it. You just have to listen to someone that has and listen to them and believe them when they tell you how lucky you are and that it can happen to you, no matter how secure your world may feel. Thank you very much.